We're live. Excellent. Boxy. Boxy. We have guests. I know. It's very exciting. Welcome to another of my uh, Ask Me Anything on George Hodel. I have Boxy here. I'm going to get into Boxy a little bit more this time. So you're not used to seeing Boxy this way. This is this is how we're going to do it this time. Um, I'm Larry Harnish. This is Boxy. Boxy is the Los Angeles District Attorney's Files in the Black Dahlia case. This is the monthly Ask Me Anything About George Hodel. Uh, only George Hodel questions, no Black Dahlia questions. The Black Dahlia questions will be the first Tuesday in March, which is March 5th. Uh, as I pointed out, uh, and I will emphasize again, it's raining in Los Angeles. And anytime it's raining in Los Angeles, there's always the chance that we could lose power. It does happen. If that happens, I'll come back a week from today, next Tuesday, if, if that happens. But anyway, for now, things are good. And I, I have kind of mood lighting going on unintentionally, inadvertently. Anyway, um, and yes, the chat is on super slow to inhibit trolls. Any harassment will get reported immediately. I am not going to mess around with harassment. If you're new, and I, I know we have at least one new person, but if you're new, uh, I have been fact-checking Steve Hodel for 20 years, ever since the publication of this book in 2003. And I don't know everything that Steve Hodel says. I have a working knowledge. I listen to a bunch of his podcasts. Uh, and I will tell you now, Steve Hodel lies all the time. He lies about everything. The average person who doesn't know anything about the Black Dahlia case or law enforcement or the legal profession or the medical profession cannot possibly imagine how much Steve Hodel lies. Let me give you a quick example. Steve likes to say that he remembers the fancy cocktail parties at the Souden house when he was seven or eight. Okay, no, he doesn't remember that. It's imaginary. Steve's Hodel, Steve Hodel's parents were divorced at that time. And Steve and his brothers weren't living at the Souden house, except in dire emergencies. We have letters that Dorothy Hodel wrote uh, to, Joy, uh, to John Houston, her first husband, uh, pleading for money, asking for money. And she will talk about living with with George at the Sadden House and how terrible it is. Um, she's kind of a drama queen and she was also a, an alcoholic. Uh, but nonetheless, there were times when they were living at the Sadden House, but it was very brief and it was uncomfortable for everyone. And I think she used the house as a mail drop. Uh, she was, she moved around a lot. So I, I think. I, I think she used the Saturn House as a mail drop, but other, otherwise, no. Um, the glittery parties that Steve describes, the who's who of Hollywood, that didn't happen. That's totally imaginary. Uh, another example is Steve likes to cite the transcripts of the bug of his father's house. And an example of that is one of the technicians running the equipment says he's having trouble with one reel. And Steve transforms that into saying his dad saying, I'm in trouble. That, that's, it's all imaginary, all of that. So I want to talk about two things before I open it up for questions. One of them is Steve likes to do validation from beyond the grave. Uh, and he has, a, he has a little dog and pony show about uh, with PowerPoint about uh, here are conveniently dead people who say I solved the Black Dahlia case. One of them is William Parker. Who was William Parker? William Parker was police chief who died in 1966. When was this published? 2003. Do you think William Parker ever read Black Dolly Avenger? Only in the afterlife. So no. Of course, that's no impediment to Steve Hodel. And I, if I, I'm relying on my memory here, I think Steve's claim is, oh, well, William Parker told his barber that the killer was a doctor. And we know who that doctor was. It's like, ah. My, my, my head heaps, my head hurts from leaps like that. And the, the second example is, uh, another example is Thad Brown. 
Uh, Thad Brown is is one of the villains in Black Dolly Avenger, of course, because there's the grand conspiracy. Anyway, but Steve likes to say Thad Brown also says that I solved it. Now, Thad Brown retired from the LAPD in 1968. And he died in 1970. Again, way before publication of... So no, this is ridiculous. And the third example is Frank Jimison. You should recognize, you might recognize the name Frank Jimison because he was the investigator for the district attorney's office. And he's the one who Steve says was the white hat who was ordered in the parallel reality of Steve Hodel. Frank Jimison was ordered to turn over the district attorney's files in the Black Dahlia case, as you can see he did, because I have them, uh, but, but kept a second set of books uh, that Steve was going to magically find many, many years later. Okay. And we're going to get into what is in here. This is why Boxy, Boxy is not enjoying being tipped up on end, but be, be strong, Boxy. Be strong. That's a good sport. Okay. Let's look instead at LAP detectives who actually heard Steve Hodell's claims who actually knew the people involved, who actually knew or know the Black Dahlia case. Example number one, Ed Jokish. Ed Jokish, I became friends with Ed Jokish. He worked homicide in the 1940s. He was buddies with Jack Donahoe, who was head of homicide at the time of the Black Dahlia killing. He knew Harry Hansen. He knew Finus Brown. He was assigned to uh, downtown homicide. He later became captain of Wilshire Division. And that's, that's how I got to meet him in retirement. Now, Ed Jokish went to his grave his, fighting with Steve Hodell and saying Steve Hodell was full of it. Um, Ed was a, if you knew Ed at all, Ed had a lot of fine qualities, but he was a bulldog. When he got his teeth into something, he didn't give up. And Ed really went after Steve Hodell. He also got Gary Ingmanson involved. Now, who is Gary Ingmanson? Gary Ingmanson, Ingmanson is the attorney for the Los Angeles Police protectively. And so Ed, retired captain of Wilshire, Wilshire Division, former homicide detective, said, yeah, Steve Hodell is full of it. Gary Ingmanson, attorney for the Los Angeles Police protectively, joined with Ed in saying, yeah, Steve Hodell is full of it. So that's two, two living people who actually read the book and said, no, Steve Hodell is full of it. Fine. Is there anyone else? Why? Yes, there is. Danny Galindo, retired homicide detective, took over the case uh, after Harry Hansen retired in 1968. Danny Galindo was the custodian of the Black Dahlia case. That's how the LAPD handled it, how RHD handled it after like after Harry Hansen retired, it was kind of in a custodial role. And one of the people who had custody of it was Danny Galindo. John St. John was also custodian of the Black Dahlia case. Uh, I can't, I wouldn't say that any of these guys were actively investigating it, but they were the custodians of the case. They knew it. Uh, they would take calls from the Repub calls from the public and that kind of thing. Danny Galindo. Danny went on television on Channel 11 with or with uh, Tony Valdez and Ed Jokish to say, yeah, Steve Hodell is full of it. Okay, so that's Ed Jokish, Gary Ingmanson, and Danny Galindo. Well, is there anyone else? Yes, there is. Rick Jackson. Oh, now who is Rick Jackson? I call Rick Jackson the godfather of L.A. crime writers. He's buddy with, buddies with James Elroy. He's buddies with Mike Conley. Uh, he's buddies with... Miles Corwin. He's a very nice guy. Um, he retired as homicide detective and then went back to head the LAPD's cold case unit. And what does he say about Steve Hodell? He said, told me personally, Rick Jackson said, well, you know, when, when this book came out, we looked at Steve Hodell's allegations. We looked at them. And if there had been anything to it, we would have signed off on it just to clear the books, just to clear the case. But nope, there's nothing to it. Okay, so that's Ed Jokish, Gary Ingmanson, Dar Danny Galindo, and Rick Jackson. Is there anyone else? Yes, there is. Brian Carr, 
another homicide detective. Now, Brian Carr was custodian of the Black Dahlia case when I was doing the bulk of my research in the 90s. Brian and Steve Hodel probably mix it up the most because uh, Brian, Brian made fun of Steve Hodel in, in the sense that he said, you know, if I, went into, if I went into the office with a case like that, they would just laugh. They would laugh me out of the office if I came in with a case like that. So, yeah, that's another one. Fine. Ed Jokish, Gary Ingmanson, Danny Galindo, Rick Jackson, Brian Carr. That's five people. Is there anyone else? Why, yes, there is. There's a guy named Sal LaBarbera who had been with RHD for years, retired homicide detective from RHD. What does he say? Oh, Hodel's been pimping that thing for years. So people who like to trot out, oh, here's all the folks who say Steve Hodel solved the case. There's five or six people who say, no, he didn't. And they are all they all have connections to homicide. They all have connections to the LAPD. And I'm not mentioning anyone who's currently at the LAPD, but you can bet there are people currently at the LAPD who say the same thing. So, no. Now, Steve will say, well, 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 tut, 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 tut. There's this conspiracy to protect the LAPD, to protect the department. There's a reason they don't accept my solution as portrayed in, that's because they have to protect uh, Chief Parker, which nobody remembers anymore, and Thad Brown, who's even more forgotten. I mean, if you went up to the average police officer today and asked them about LAPD history, you'd, you'd get a blank look. Uh, the most they know is, they, they might know William Parker because Parker Center was named after him. Thad Brown would be blank look. They don't know. They don't know. Okay. That is the, so that's my response to the validation from beyond the grave. And it, it is just ridic as ridiculous as it seems. And now the spotlight turns to Boxy. Okay. Now, Instagram people, you probably can't see Boxy real well because I'm stuck in this weird uh, portrait uh, uh, format instead of land, uh, instead of uh, landscape. YouTube people, you can see Boxy. This is, I have turned Boxy up on end. Uh, most, these are, these are all files in the Black Dahlia case. That's what these are. And I have flagged all of the files that have anything to do with George Hodel. They are this one, this one, this one, this one and the hotel transcripts, which are here. That's it. Everything else other than these, everything aside from these is not George Hodel. Really? Yes. Now, what do we have here? Well, this is, this is Frank Jemison's interview with Dorothy Hodel's mom. That is a couple of pages. I have here a memo. What's well, totally burning out? Sorry about that. I have a memo about si uh, setting up the electronic bugging equipment at George Hodel's house. Okay, where did oh, you go in back in here? Then I have what is this? Oh, this is Frank Jemison's final memo, uh, his summation of the case, where he says the evidence tends to eliminate George Hodel. Oh dear. I have here a letter from Mary Uncafer about Lillian Lenorak living at the Hodel house. And finally, the district attorney's transcripts. And that is freaking it. All this other stuff, everything you see up here, all of that is not George Hodel. It's Leslie Dillon. A lot on Leslie Dillon. It's, oh, there's a lot on the Astro Motel. There's a lot on the Crown Jewel cocktail lounge grill, what have you. They investigated the heck out of this stuff. Um, so when Steve Hodel says, yeah, it's in the district attorney's files, it's, there's almost nothing. I mean, I could pull these folders out of here and you wouldn't even know it. Well, Boxy would be a little bit lighter, 
but that's it. Now, Steve also likes to say things that are here that aren't in here. And a great example of that is my dad was suspected of killing his secretary. No, that's not in here. The only place Ruth Spaulding turns up, and not by name, is in the Hodel's transcripts. And what George Hodel says is they can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. Pardon me. That's true. She was dead. Um, and, and, and later, he gets into it a little bit about it. Now, the reality, uh, he talks a little bit about it. He might have called, the, I don't know if he called the cab or, or whatever happened, but it doesn't matter. Um, she committed suicide. We have her death certificate. I posted it online. Um, she committed suicide with an overdose of barbiturates. As inconvenient as that may be um, to Steve Hodel, that is the reality. The inconvenient reality is that she wasn't killed. She wasn't murdered. Nobody was ever suspected of murdering her. It was a clear open case of an over, overdose of barbiturates, and that's it. Okay, now I am done with Steve Hodell's alleged validation from beyond the grave and how ridiculous that is. And Boxy here and the meager, the meager amount uh, that's in George Hodell. You might think, again, you might get the idea if all you know is what Steve Hodell said, that the district attorney's files are brimming bursting with information about George Hodel. Nah, almost nothing. Almost nothing. Okay. So let us go now to the questions. And the way this works is I will alternate, oh, but hurt hotline. Uh, I will alternate between uh, submitted questions and the live questions. So let me roll back here. Hello, everybody. Um, and let's see, let's see. Interesting piece from 1997, very brief, brief interview of Phoebe and Virginia Short. Yeah, Chip, I'm going to, I don't, I'm not going to do Black Dahlia questions now. I'm guessing that's from Tony Valdez's piece uh, on for the 50th anniversary. Uh, Lady Tyler Bio Rodriguez, does Steve still go on about the Eric Kirk incident being connected to the Dahlia case? I don't remember. Is, is that somehow the Gene Spangler thing? Um, Steve has to do, Here, here's what I can tell you about Steve Hodell, George Hodell, and the Gene Spangler thing. George Hodell was arrested uh, for, on, on charges of, of uh, uh, sexual conduct with his, his daughter, Tamar. He was arrested. While George was in jail, uh, Gene Spangler disappeared. And... Steve's, Steve's claim is that, well, George had to, you know, immediately bail out of jail. And as of course, as one would do if you had just been arrested and possibly under surveillance, is go out and kill a, a, a bit actress, uh, Jean Spangler. And I mean, the reality is we don't know what happened to Jean Spangler. Is she dead? Well, she probably is, but we don't know that. We don't know whatever happened to Jean Spangler, uh, but there, nobody's ever established a connection between George Hodel and Gene Spangler. Um, it's just Steve Steve Hodel wishing things were true, and boom, they're true. That that's how he operates. So I'm I'm going to assume, uh, Lady Bio Rodriguez, that Kirk is the is the um, the Gene Spangler reference to Kirk. Um, other than that, I th if that's not it. Uh, put it in the comments and I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can dredge up something. Um, Doug says, not sure how much you want to go into the surrealism art thing. And I've ordered, but not read exquisite corpse, but I've tried to think what someone who really wanted to send a surrealist message would do. Please don't judge me too harshly. I checked out the 120 days of Sodom reference. Steve Hodel notes the passages regarding activities on January 15th and chapter 17. Was surprised to find that this date is in the third part of the book described in Wikipedia, I know you hate it. Part three, January, the criminal passions. The notes outline tales of libertines who 
indulge in criminal activities, albeit stopping short of murder. Part four involves the murderous passions. I have more, but don't want you to think I am a freak. Bottom line, a real surrealist would have waited until February. Um, anyone trying to make a surrealist reference would have cut the eyeballs. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, uh, evoking uh, Salvador Dali's La Chaine Andalou. Um, you can find lots of references that say in U.S. surrealism was identified with Dolly. Uh, Steve Hodel references Dolly in Black Dolly Avenger 2. Uh, not only was Dr. George Hill Hodel captivated by all things Dolly and surreal, uh, you are enough of a cinephile to know Ashen Andalou and the picture Steve re reproduces from Spelldown reference the same thing. Uh, the Man Ray, lo the lover's thing is irrelevant, but you knew that. Um, so, yeah, you know, my my take on it is surrealism was was a movement uh, playing with reality, and whether it involved, I mean, the the Steve Hodel's link to all of that, his leap to that is well, okay, Man Ray and George Hodel had a relationship. We know that. Uh, Steve likes to portray Man Ray as the Olin Mills of the Hodel family. Olin Mills was the cheapo portrait photographer at J.C. Penney. Uh, no, uh, Man Ray was a an expatriate from uh, Paris uh, during World War II, and Steve just flipped through a book of Man Ray photographs uh, and saw the Minotaur and decided, well, okay, that has to be the Elizabeth Short pose, and therefore. Uh, and he came up with this whole elaborate theory about murder and and Elizabeth Short was George O'Dell's canvas and in tribute to Man Ray. And it's like, ow, that just makes my head hurt. It's, it's just goofy. Um, Eugene, is it true that George O'Dell was mentioned in a biography of Man Ray? I don't know. I haven't read all the biographies of Man Ray. I can tell you that there is absolutely zero mention of George Hodel in like the Man Ray notebooks or anything like that. I have been in contact with a gentleman who's a real Man Ray scholar, and he says there's nothing nothing to what uh, Steve Hodel says. And beyond, beyond that, I really don't have much to say about the whole surrealism thing. It's a leap. Um, Steve, Steve just, Steve just, sponges from all over to create this massive he's he spent 20 years trying to establish his father as a prolific serial killer based on some goofy art associations or whatever and it's just no anyway let's see does steve still go on oh okay um you mentioned brian carr yeah brian carr uh Brian Carr was custodian of the Black Dahlia Files after the retire, uh, retirement of Paul, oh, I can't remember his name now. Um, the, 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 previous, the previous fellow who had the Black Dahlia Files, I, I'll think of it in a minute, uh, left to go work with the Orange County District Attorney's Office. And so Brian was his partner and the, the Black Dahlia case got handed off to Brian Carr. And so I interviewed Brian Carr in 1996 and uh, got to look at the LAPD's files. Now, I didn't, I didn't get to actually see the files. Brian unlocked the file cabinet in RHD. At that time, it was in Parker Center. Uh, he unlocked the file cabinet. He pulled open the drawer and he said, Here, here's the stuff. Uh, I wasn't allowed to look at any of it, but it's the file cabinet is jam packed with paper. Uh, it is just absolutely crammed full of stuff. And so what happened? The, the long answer is this. Um, if you if you think back, there used to be a separate uh, metropolitan transit police department and they got absorbed into the local law enforcement. Some of them went with the LAPD and some of them went with the sheriff's department. And one of the people, one of the officials from the, I, I believe it was the, the transit uh, authority, uh, was a woman named Sharon Papa. And she had heard a Steve Hodel reading or something like that. She was a newcomer. She was an outsider to the LAPD. 
And she said, well, hey, there's something to, maybe there's something to this, how about it? And so that's, that's how it all came about. Brian Carr was given the task of checking out Steve Hodell's claims and seeing if there was anything to it. So he actually went through a bunch of the Black Dahlia uh, material that nobody had looked at for a long time. He actually knew it. He was, to, to counteract Steve Hodell's claims, he actually had to go in and, and brief himself on the Dahlia stuff. And he was di very dismissive of Steve. Uh, again, he, again, he said, if I went in, if I went in with a case like that, I'd get laughed out of the office. Now, I also forgot to I also forgot to mention Sandy Gibbons. Sandy Gibbons was in the public Inf information office of the district attorney uh, under Steve Cooley, and I got to know her. She was present when Steve Hodell and Steve K made their presentation to Steve Cooley about the Black Dahlia case, and she just she just rolled her eyes. Apparently, she rolled her eyes during their presentation. And she rolled her eyes every time the name Steve Hodell came up. Uh, interesting. Speaking of Stephen K, I speaking of Stephen K, I tried to email him just to see if he still supports Steve Hodell's claims because you know Steve Hodell, uh, Steve K's K claims, Steve Stephen K's claims. I can say that Stephen K's claims are twenty one years old. Uh, the email bounced. So I'm going to try to reach out to Stephen K somehow just to see if he still thinks so. Um, anyway, that, that's, that's the long answer about Brian Carr. Because Brian was actually in the LAPD and in robbery homicide and Steve was an ex-cop, uh, they, they, there was a little more friction between the two of them. The main thing, the main thing with Brian, and I'm, I'm glad I remembered it to mention it, Brian says, you know what? If Steve Hodell had come to me before he wrote and asked to see his dad's file, I would have showed it to him out of professional courtesy. If he'd just come and said, hey, Brian, my dad was a suspect in the Black Dahlia case. Can I see his file? Uh, I would have showed it to him. He didn't do that. He, he talked to every, you know, he did all this stuff in secret. And then he comes in and accuses the department. He's, and he said, I'm sick of Steve Hodell bashing the department. And so as a result of that, I can pretty much guarantee you Steve Hodell will never, ever, ever get his hands into the Black Dahlia files. Never. Um, so that, Gene Marie, that's, that's kind of the long, that's kind of the long thing about Brian Carr. But yeah, that's, that, that is it. Um, I had lunch with Brian Carr a couple of years ago. He's retired. And that's the one thing he, he made sure to mention is that Steve Hodell never, never asked to see his dad's file before he wrote the book. Big mistake. Let's see. Um, let's go over here to Elena. Steve Hodell says that in 1950, the original DA's investigators suspected George Hodell might have buried victims' bodies in the basement of the Southern Franklin House and a trained dog Buster finding some proof of it. Uh, I love Buster the cadaver dog. Uh, it, it's sort of, there were stories written about Buster where he's, it's a cute animal story combined with Jack the Ripper. Uh, what, what is in here? And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it's, it's one of these flag files, but yeah, they did talk to a guy um, he was either a plumber or an electrician. I tend to think he was a plumber who went down in the basement of the Southern house to do some work. And they asked him, did you notice any freshly dug dirt uh, or something along those lines? And he said, you know, I was just down there to check the pipes. I didn't, I didn't go th around the whole basement. And I, I want to, I, I want to give for people who don't live in Los Angeles or don't live in the U S what are we talking about? when in California, when we say the basement of a house. It is not, if you're from some other part of the country where they have a finished basement with a rec room and, you know, it's kind of like the man cave. There's a, a TV center and a billiard table and a bar and all that. That's not what basements in, in Los Angeles generally look like. 
most of the time it's an area that's dug out and you'll have like a water heater down there or a boiler or a furnace, uh, maybe a little bit of storage, that kind of thing. It is by no means a finished basement. Uh, the finished, I can only think of one. I can only think, now I've never been in the Southern house, so maybe that's different, but I can only think of one house <coughs> here in LA that actually had a basement. It was some ritzy estate in, I think it was Hancock Park, and there was a bowling alley. Now you're going to go, oh, wow, a bowling alley. Well, it was one <laughs> it was one lane of a bowling alley. Uh, so th there was a bowling lane down there, but it was one. And it was from the era when you had a guy set up pins. I mean, we're talking the 1920s. Uh, but other than that, Los Angeles homes generally don't have basements. They might have a crawl space, but that's it. And without getting access to the Southern House, um, if you have the idea that it's a, um, that wasn't Melliker, it was somebody, it was the guy's name was Paul. Um, anyway, uh, okay. So, so that's kind of that. Now, in terms of Buster, uh, that is, that's an interesting story. Steve's kind of a con man. And so the, uh, the con, these con men kind of, uh, have a radar for each other. And so Steve Hodell hooked up with a guy named Paul Dosty, who had Buster the Cadaver Dog. And and Paul Dosty and Buster had gone to, I think they conned um, some law enforcement to go out to Death Valley because they thought they they had found a Manson family crime scene. And they, they dug up there for a couple of days and they didn't find, guess what? They didn't find anything. Uh, without knowing more specifically about Buster the Cadaver Dog, I can tell you from research that um, dogs, whether they are detecting drugs or explosives or any kind of contraband, you have to work with them all the time. It's a dog. It isn't like you just train the dog and that's it. Um, I know that specifically uh, dogs that are trained to work to detect explosives or um, drugs, those handlers are working with them constantly. And I'm not sure Buster got that kind of um, co constant, um, you know, reinforcement. And the other thing is that those dogs age out of their job. You can't, they age out. So um, what happened was there was a TV show. Uh, I think it was about Haunted, I, I forget now if it was Haunted America or something like that, but they, they got Steve Hodell and they got Buster the cadaver dog, and Buster alerted, um, which in some areas, and supposedly it was human remains. And again, we know where Elizabeth Short's remains are. They're up buried up in Oakland. Uh, so it's not going to be it's not going to be Elizabeth Short. But once they got their samples, uh, they sent them off to this yet another con artist who spent, he sat on those samples for like a year or a year and a half. Uh, his name is something like Armand Voss. You can Google him. And he said, oh yeah, well, human, rela human remains within the last hundred years. I mean, it's a, these people are a joke. These people are a joke. Uh, so anyway, um, but Steve gets a lot of, of attention out of Buster the Cadaver Dog, and he'd like to go down in the basement and all that kind of stuff. And it's the current ownership of the Southern House, as far as I know, uh, it, he's never going to get back in there. Uh, oh, and I forgot to mention that section, that segment was recorded for a TV show and they ended up not using it. So that's, that is clips from like, uh, th those were outtakes from some TV show is all the stuff with Buster the Cadaver Dog. Um, and I think I have exhausted <laughs> the, the subject of Buster the Cadaver Dog, who was cute and all that stuff, but in terms of anything substantive, no, not really. Um, let's see. Supposedly when George Hodel's home was bugged, they heard a woman screaming. I'm sure this is one of Steve's lies, but have you heard anything about it? Yes, I have. It's in, um, it's in here. It's in the transcripts. It's, it's at the very beginning. Uh, it's like page three or four. 
I did. If you're really interested, I did. If you're really interested, I did a dramatic reading of the Hodel transcripts in the persona of not Dr. Alan Campbell. Um, I did a dramatic reading. And yes, but you know, the thing is, what do they say? They, Steve has tried to make that into uh, there was a murder. They heard the murder. The guys bugging the house heard the murder and they did nothing. And so that's why they covered this up. Well, no. I, I, and I've gone about, I've gone over some of this in previous previous segments. The guidelines on LAPD or surveillance is if something happens while you have somebody under surveillance and it's not related to the investigation, you ignore it. More important, rule number one of surveillance is don't tip off the subject. Don't let them know. Don't compromise the investigation. And so what happened? Uh, it's, it's, it's in here um, where George O'Dell says, number one, what does he say? They're out to get me. Hmm. What else does he say? Men from the telephone company were here. He knew. And so, and if you, if you go through the transcripts, scripts, if you go through the transcripts, scripts, if you go through the transcripts carefully, you will see where he is looking for the microphones. He knows they're out to get me. And it's in the very first pages of the transcripts. They're out to get me. The men from the telephone company were here. And then he's looking around and he says, they must be here someplace. And so, yeah, he knew the place was bugged. And as soon as he's done looking for the microphones, then he starts shooting off his mouth. Now, the woman's screaming. Yeah. Here's the thing. And if I were, if, if I were an attorney in court and this came in as evidence, I would say, well, Detective Hodell, do not the transcripts show that George Hodell listened to the radio? Yes, he did. Did he not have the radio on while the house was bugged? Yes, he did. Isn't it possible that it was a radio show that he was listening to where that happened? Oh, could be. Because you see, it, that is in the transcripts. George Hodell, knowing that he was bugged, he had the radio on all the time. And the guys who were listening to him would say, oh, Hodell is listening to Mexican music. Hodell is listening to Chinese music. It's worse than the Mexican music. Yeah, th there's all kinds of like little commentaries on George Hodell's life in the transcript. Uh, so is it in there? Yeah, it's in there. But you again, you have to have context. And that's the context that you never, you never get from Steve Hodell. Let's go. Now, I got something from Instagram here. I'm an expert on the Zodiac, Zodiac crimes and the claim Steve makes about how it was George make no sense. If he lies about Zodiac, he definitely lies about the Black Dahlia. Thanks for exposing his lies. You're welcome. And I have to say, if you think I am brutal to Steve Hodell about the Black Dahlia case, the Zodiac people are much, much tougher. Wow. Wow. Um, but it, it's kind of like, I'll let the Zodiac people fight that battle with Steve Hodell. I'm only going to do the Black Dolly and that stuff because um, there's a lot of expertise involved in the Zodiac case that I don't have. And I don't have time to get up to speed on the Zodiac case in that way. I will just have to say it shows really something, something wrong with Steve Hodell where he's had to attach his father to all of these famous murders, um, it's it's pretty bizarre. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Let me moving back to a submitted question here. Um, is it interesting to anyone that two of George Hodel's kids are pathological liars? Of course, he had many more kids, but it's fascinating to me that two of them who had different mo mothers and were raised in different homes nonetheless display the same distinctly uncertain relationship with reality. I would be interested in knowing if Tamar believed her own lies too, but certainly not interested enough to engage in any way with her descendants empire of hot air. Well, wow, joy. Well said. It's, that's a good question. My, 
my hunch is this. Tamar definitely had reality issues. Uh, she, she exhibited, pro, it, she started lying at an early age. When you go through and read the original news accounts from the trial of George Hodel, her mom says that, yeah, I had her seen by a psychiatrist when she was, I think, seven or eight. Uh, Tamar started accusing men of molesting her and telling fantastic stories. And in the trial of George Hodel, they had about, about 10 women, women, all women, who knew Tamar, Tamar uh, her mom, her grandmother, various other ladies. The grandmother supposedly got off of her deathbed uh, or her sickbed, at least, to testify about Tamar. And they said, no, we wouldn't believe her under oath. And there's, there's really nobody uh, to support what she says uh, other than Steve Hodel wanting it to be true. So Tamar has got, there's this Tamar line of the family. Tamar and then Fauna, Fauna number one, uh, and then you've got her daughters, Rasha and Yvette, and then you have Steve. And I think my hunch is what happened is uh, Steve, right? Tamar, th there was enough of an age difference between Tamar and Steve where he, he kind of knew her. He knew about her, but they didn't really have a lot of contact, but he knew what she said. And so when Steve goes to write Black Belly Avenger, he, he wrote it in, he wrote that book, book in total secrecy. Again, he did not ask Brian Carr to see his dad's files, but nobody in the Hodel family had a clue of what he was working on until the book was published. And some of them were royally ticked off. They were. Um, Duncan, the oldest half-brother, never talked to Steve again. Uh, the Philippine branch of the family, they also had, they hate Steve. Um, but what happened was... Um, Fauna, Fauna, Fauna number one had an interesting life. Tamar handed her off to a black family under the, under the cover story that, oh, well, she's really black and she'll turn black someday. So Fauna was, was handed off to a black family. She was handed off to a washroom attendant in Nevada. Okay. Um, and raised and thinking that she was black. I mean, that, that in and of itself, by, by itself alone, a white lady being raised thinking she was black and then finding out, no, she's not. That's an interesting story. You don't have to do anything to jazz that up. But Fauna read Steve's book and suddenly, hey, that's a good story. I'm going to incorporate all of that. So Fauna then incorporates all of Steve's claims, which then go into I am the knight and root of evil with Rasha and Yvette. Uh, by the time I Am the Night and Root of Evil roll around, Fawn is dying of cancer. And so she hands off the project to her daughters, Yvette and Rasha, who are handed a script uh, by a guy named Zach Levitt, who did Root of Evil. Uh, that that show, how much, however much you love that podcast, it is 100% scripted. They were told exactly what to say. Do they have any conscience about saying that? I don't think so. Apparently not. Um, but it, 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 is, it does say something about certain branches of the Hodel family. Um, yeah, it's really something. Let's see. Uh, Lady, Lady Tyler Bio Rodriguez, I believe Mitzi Roberts is the custodian of the case now. That is correct. She is. Uh, I presume she doesn't believe Steve. Uh, Mitzi Roberts is sharp. Now, she also is, like Rick Jackson, <laughs> an advisor to Mike Conley. Uh, I believe one of the characters in either the Bosch series or something else is, uh, is based on her. So I have, I have spoken with Mitzi Roberts. Um, I have a lot of respect for her. She's a sharp lady. And I'll, I will leave it at that. Again, I'm not going to get into um, anything about people currently. Uh, at the LAPD, but I have spoken with her. I will say that. Okay, let's. Oh, here's another. So here's another one from Lady Tyler uh, Bio Rodriguez. Uh, George and Dorero Hodel clearly had artistic pretensions. Pretensions, yes, that's true. 
and enjoyed hanging out with our art artsy types, even if their own talents were me meager to non-existent. Yes, that is also true. Uh, in that regard, they were like a bargain basement, Gerald and Sarah Murphy. Elizabeth Short, on the other hand, seemed to enjoy striking up conversations with ordin ordinary Joes at dime store lunch counters. Yeah, I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, Elizabeth Short was was discriminating in the sense that she was looking for somebody who was going to, um, somebody who would pick up the tab for a meal or a date or something like that. But yeah, if Elizabeth Short had been dating a Hollywood doctor, wouldn't she have blabbed about that to everyone she knew? Uh, she seems to have had a compulsive need to window dress the details of her life. One shudders to think of her alive today in our Instagram age. If she had actually had something to crow about, how likely is that that she would have kept it to herself? That's an excellent question. Uh, that That is an excellent question. Um, someone asked in a previous thing, maybe it was you, what did, they, what did Elizabeth Short and George, what would they have had to talk about? Um, a great question. A great question. My take on George is that he grew up as kind of a rich, somewhat pampered kid with a brain. He was a smart guy. There's no question about that. Uh, but his parents kind of indulged uh, their brainchild. Um, and he he did graduate from school early. That is true. Um, but he did have artistic pretensions. He wanted to have, he wanted to turn the Southern House into kind of this bohemian place. He dabbled in photography. I don't think he was very good at it. Um, whether he, he had a publication that tanked almost immediately. Uh, but in terms of his writing ability, uh, Steve has pulled this, his, write, his reporting career out of thin air. Um, there isn't a single byline by George Hodel in the Los Angeles record. Steve, Hodel, Steve will say, oh, yeah, well, my dad... Uh, was doing uh, vice cases and he was doing murder cases and he was writing with them. There's, there isn't a word of proof on that at all, that there isn't a single, and I've gone through the LA record searching for George, George Hodel bylines and there just aren't any uh, in those days. Yes, it's true. Reporters rarely got bylines, but unless Steve, you know, says, okay, my dad wrote this exact story. I don't believe it. Now he will, he, he has, got a story. It's a sidebar, uh, sort of a mood piece about the main story is about a, a killing. And there's a mood piece about the room and the woman who was killed, the victim, and there's a bloody, now he's, he was saying ace of spades. He's changed it to an ace of diamonds. There's a bloody playing card and all that kind of stuff. And I found the story. Guess what? There's no byline on it. We don't know who wrote it. There's nothing to show that his dad wrote it. It's, it's just Steve Hodel wanting it to be true. Okay. Um, why do these so-called true crime documentaries on TV, YouTube, always state that George Hodel was the killer? Surely it's in their better interest to state the true facts. Okay, Jules, you ask a terrific question. Thank you. Those documentaries are why I don't do interviews anymore. That's why I do Ask Me Anything, because I am done with true crime interviews. Uh, that's that's actually part of a much longer discussion. Is true crime broken? Uh, I, I keep running across various folks, whether they're retired homicide detectives or uh, there's, there's a woman who writes about like true crime books for the New York Times. And they've all said true crime is broken. And in a sense, in a sense it is, there is a glut of, of true crime. Um, a lot of it isn't very good. And when, when I started, Jules, when I started doing uh, interviews, uh, when I started doing interviews on the Black Dahlia case, um, the, the productions, some of them were sketchy, but some of them were very good. Uh, I did one with Bill Curtis that was probably one of the best of them, but they put a lot of money in it. It was a they had two of their own camera guys. They had two of their own sound guys. We drove around. They set up the location. Um, a lot of them are really fly by night. And ever since, ever since making a murderer, uh, everybody's doing true crime, and the quality has dropped like a rock. And most interestingly, uh, what I'm seeing now is artificial intelligence uh, used, being used to generate uh, true crime videos. 
I, I have alerts set up for anything relating to the Black Dahlia, and I'm getting alert after alert of something on YouTube with no views, one view, and it's all stock art scraped off the internet. Uh, it's a, a computer voice or some sort of artificial voice narrating it, and it's just Artificial intelligence, as far as I can tell, is just glutting YouTube with these bogus videos in hope of that something will catch on. But there's a ton of them. It's amazing. Um, so that's kind of my rant about that. But really, I, I, I just don't do them anymore. Um, I'm just happier about it. And um, it was a, the, the last couple the last couple that I did were so fly by night. You know, I mean. I've been doing them for I've been doing them for twenty something years, and the public, you, you the person watching the true crime show on television, uh, you would have no idea how much how much how much how they cut corners, how they do like a no frills show. Uh, it's it's stunning. Uh, I did one where it was God it. it, it Honestly, it was an we shot it in an industrial park, and it looked like they were doing porn films there. But what they did was they sat me at a table, and they had a light on me, so you couldn't see the background. You couldn't see just how <laughs> chunky this industry, you know, this this industrial park was. And I did the interview, but nobody does their homework anymore. It's just so it's like, yeah, I don't do them anymore. I'm a lot happier, and. I, I, I will end my rant there on true crime. Um, okay. Uh, how much harm is Steve doing to the Black Dahlia case in Europe? A lot. A lot. And I, and I got into this last time. Um, I got an attorney. I, I got a letter from attorney Anthony Salerno about what did Steve Hodell do to me and how did he hurt me? It, it's not personal in the sense that it's what Steve Hodell has done to the Short family. He's victimized them all over again with his crazy, crazy stories. Uh, he, he's muddied the water so much that it, it, it's, you know, I mean, when you go to Wikipedia, for example, it's all just regurgitated Steve Hodel uh, nonsense. There's a whole section. And I, and I will tell you, I monitor Wikipedia. I don't write anything on Wikipedia. Uh, I gave up writing anything about on Wikipedia years and years and years and years ago. It's not worth it. But I monitor uh, Wikipedia certain entries. And the reason is that years ago as a prank, a guy named Jacob Edward Fisk was added to the list of Black Dahlia suspects. It was a prank. It was one day. It was deleted. But every so often, someone will go back and add Edward Jacob Fisk. And I that's the one thing I will do. So I will, I will take him out. Other than that, I just observe. And what goes on with the Black Dahlia Wikipedia entry and some of that stuff, at, at this point, there is this huge section on in the Black Dahlia entry on lone woman murders. Well, lone woman murders are, was invented by Steve Hodell. Okay. There was nothing at the time called the lone woman murders. Steve Hodell made that up. Uh, but it is just it has just gotten it has just gotten glopped into uh, the black dike. It's like the Glasgow Smile. The Glasgow Smile was from Wikipedia. Some British true crime fan added that years and years ago, and now everybody calls it the Glasgow Smile. So, yeah, he's done a lot of harm. Um, let's see. Why did the surgeon kill? I don't know. Um, okay, Malcolm, if Elizabeth Short had been dating a doctor, wouldn't she have blabbed about it to everybody? Malcolm, you and you and uh, Lady Tyler uh, Rodriguez ought to get together. You're asking exactly the same questions. <laughs> uh, okay, I just did that one. Um, let's see, if Elizabeth Short had a well-heeled doctor as her boyfriend, why didn't he set her up in an apartment? Um, you know, that that's an interesting point, and 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 Ann Toth said exactly that um, when she was interviewed by Finest Brown and Frank Jimison, and they asked her, "Was she do? Was she a prostitute?" And she, or you know, was she do? You know, selling sex, essentially. 
Uh, that's not the, an exact quote, but that's what they were asking. And she said, you know what? The women who are doing that, um, they're out at all hours and they have money. Elizabeth Short never had a, never had a dime. Uh, she was always broke. So probably not. So that's kind of, that's kind of my answer. Now, Ann Toth says um, there was somebody who offered to set her up, but I haven't found any evidence of that other than Ann Toth saying that. And you have to remember that Elizabeth Short made up a lot of things. Um, she was the first person to fictionalize her own life. And so did was that real? Yeah, maybe not. Let's see. Okay, yeah. Um, let's go back to the beginning here. Okay, that's all the surrealism questions. We're running, we're running close on time. I'm going to have to shut that Instagram in a few moments because uh, they cut off at an hour, and if I if I go over an hour, the the recording gets nuked, and I don't want that to happen. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, here's one. Were were medical students in the 1930s instructed in the bisection of human beings? There was no medical use for such a procedure. As for the hemicorporectomy Hodel likes to adduce, according to Dr. Bernard Ferrara, the concept of the operation was first voiced in 1950 and the first operation was reported in 1960. Absolutely right. Now, again, Steve Hodel will claim that they taught that in medical school in the 1930s. No, they did not. That is, that is, yet another Steve Hodel fantasy, uh, but he does that. Uh, one of the things he does, and I, there's, I, I broke out another session on how does Steve Hodel lie. If, if you're interested in that, I broke it down. He has four methods, of, four methods of lying, which are inflation, distortion, suppression, and fiction. And this is fiction, where he just makes stuff up that he wants to be true. And he's very good at that. Um, and this is one of them. Okay, Instagram, I am going to say goodbye to you. It's been fun. Okay. Let's see. End video. All right. Okay. Um, so let, I can go, I'll go a couple minutes longer here. Um, but Steve Hodel just, he pulls things out of thin air that he wants to be true. It, it is no more difficult than that. And he has been doing it for 20 years. He spent the last 20 years plus establishing his father as a criminal genius and prolific serial killer. And does he believe it? Yeah, he does. I mean, I think Steve, and I'll, I'll end with this. I think Steve started, I, I think Steve wrote this book as a scam. He wrote it in secret. Nobody knew what he was working on. Uh, it seems rather secretive and devious to me to do that. But I think over the years, he has talked himself into believing it. I think he believes it now. Um, and he gets very uh, testy and defensive if he's challenged. So does he believe it now? Yeah, I don't think he always did. Uh, my, but, I, but I think it, it's, it's like he's hooked on the attention, getting more interviews, uh, selling more books, writing more books, that he can't let go of it. Um, and it, it is expensive just mushroomed into this, what's really a parallel universe, which is pretty sad. It's a parallel reality. And folks, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. It's been fun. The time has gone fast. Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, next week, uh, Boxy will be um, not deshabille, as we say, but it, it is, you know, you might be interested in seeing just how much is is in boxy that has absolutely nothing absolutely nothing to do with george hodell the vast majority of it is not george hodell stuff at all okay do it again next month have a great week or have a great month uh see you later okay folks